1 Corinthians 7. I didn't bring my little New Testament, but somehow I don't I always have it right here. And I feel lopsided. Right here. I reached for it over there. So you're going to have to participate. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 7. You're going to have to read the scripture. And I'll stop you mid word. Probably I'll let you say the word, but then I'll comment. And then I'll have you read it again. Let's go to our signed reading, 1 Corinthians chapter 7. You need to uh, <clears throat> decide whether or not you want to get married when you read stuff like this. Because this is going to talk about the nitty gritty of sex life. I want to pause right here and comment about the Song of Solomon for you that are online. Wondering if I was going to do anything in depth to the Song of Solomon, the answer is no, I'm not. I do not plan to either read the Song of Solomon in class, you read it outside of class. I'm going to comment just for a moment on the genre. The genre is the type of literature you have in the Song of Solomon. The Song of Solomon is a, it appears to be a, uh, epic poem. It appears to be a beautiful poetic description of love. The question comes up, is it spiritual love between Christ and the church? Or is it God's commentary on the delight, the design, the divine intention of physical love between a husband and a wife. If you would align viewpoints from commentators, I would have a stack, multiple stacks, reaching to the ceiling, the view that it's spiritual love between Christ and the church. From the first century up until the 18th century, that was just about the united view. And so I, when I, on the rare occasions I heard someone preach on the Song of Solomon, it was usually a woman preacher. I don't know why that was. Maybe they're a bit more in tune to romanticizing the relationship of Christ to his bride, us. Maybe that's easier for a feminine mind than a masculine mind. I have never been excited about calling myself a bride. <laughs> I'm sure that's a cultural condition. We use that word bride for a woman. We call the man the bridegroom. And so the one's culture determines the impact of words. But you and I, together, all Christians, make up the bride of Jesus Christ. And Jesus is our espoused husband. And so there's the view that the Song of Solomon, when he kissed me with thy kisses, thy kisses are the kisses of your mouth. Your kisses are sweeter than wine is spiritually to be interpreted as the delightful intimacy of close relationship with Jesus. The minority view that has come to the forefront in the 20 and 21st century <coughs> excuse me, is that it is a divine commentary on the design and the delights and the, the holiness of physical love and sexual uh, behavior, attraction, loving behavior, one toward the other in a marital relationship. And the argument to support the 
second view that I'm talking about now. And if you want to read a book, the man's name is Solomon, interestingly enough, last name Solomon, and the title is On Sex. And it's a commentary on Song of Solomon by a guy's last name Solomon. No, that's wrong. The title is Solomon on Sex. Solomon on Sex. Solomon on Sex. Let's look at our bibliography that I provided in your uh, uh, for your this course. Does anyone? Have, yes, I have a syllabus. And uh, if you look at page um, eight, nine, page nine. Dillo, D-I-L-L-O-W. There you go. Joseph Dillo, Solomon on Sex, a biblical guide to marital marriage, married love. So the last name of the man is Dillo. Joseph J. Dillow, Joseph Dillow, and his book is Solomon on Sex. And what he does is he says, he argues that since God designed male and female anatomy, and since there is such a huge, powerful force that God designed through hormonal, visual, and other attractions that would cause a man to want to take a woman as his wife and then to mate, and uh, the normal result would be children, that did God give no guidelines? Did God leave a vacuum about this huge area of human life, <coughs> sexuality, is the only thing he says is no sex before marriage. But after marriage, what's appropriate? And Dillo argues that this is God's divine commentary to say that Sexual, the sexual aspect of a relationship of a husband and a wife is holy and it's sanctified and it is to be delighted in and bring you much joy and much pleasure. God designed it that way. And you read the book of Proverbs when you did the strange woman paper. As you read, you're supposed to have read Proverbs. It's going to tell you that men are supposed to be attractive and to be satisfied with various aspects of the female anatomy. And I'm just am not in the mood today to be more specific than that for some reason. But uh, again, I happen to uh, lean strongly toward Dillow's view. You hear me? Lean? Because of the history of interpreters, I, I don't have any dogmatism on the proper way to interpret Song of Solomon. If you're very interested in pursuing this view prior to marriage, get the book, it's in the library, and read it. It's divinely, but you know, the uh, rabbis ask male men not to read the book before some say 30 and some say 40 years of age. Because it's a rather, um, well, kiss me. And you're, you know, he describes the female anatomy through, um, I guess if you were pastoral and grew up on a farm and thought sheep's eyes or various eyes or beautiful eyes and your neck like a gazelle and whatever. I used to read that as a kid and laugh. <laughs> and then want to go around and say, Mom, your neck is like a gazelle. And, and I just hooted and hollered because I thought it was so funny. I had no clue. But evidently, I, obviously, I didn't know what a gazelle looked like particularly. So maybe there's something very graceful and very lovely about the neck of a gazelle. First Corinthians chapter 7. Please turn in your Bible. First Corinthians 7, please.
Now listen to this. This is writing to Christians. And the question comes up, how often are you supposed to have sex in a marriage? Now typically, that's a question a woman would ask. I was told, I'd rather keep it out there, my wife was told, and she shared with me, that uh, this young lady, prior to her marriage, was informed by her mother that be prepared for your husband to want to have sex every night, at least for the first while in your marriage. Really? <laughs> Why? It's just the way they are. Sometimes they might want to have it more than once a day. So she got herself all mentally, whatever, emotionally prepared for this um, unknown experience. And was shocked that he wasn't wanting to have sex every day. So she talked to her mother, what's wrong with my husband? He's not wanting to have sex every day. He, he, he wants it when he wants it, and he wants it to be special, and he doesn't even want to get undressed in front of me. He was a very private person. And I don't know what this woman's mother, the story, my information stops about there. <laughs> I don't know what she said. I'm sure she said something. <laughs> Whether that that's weird, or you're blessed, or that's just cold. <laughs> I don't know what she said. There were, well, there's a gamut of options she could have said, right? Depending on her own personal opinion. And so, the, the, the point I'm trying to emphasize is what is normal? What are you supposed to expect? Uh, what is the proper frequency? read, who has 1 Corinthians and can read loud enough. Amit, go ahead. Now for the matters you wrote about. So evidently they're interested in knowing this has come up. For, you know, I've never written anybody that question. Have you? Go ahead. <laughs> it is good for a man not to have sexual relations with a woman. That's right. Before you get married, no sex. Go on. But since sexual immorality is occurring, each man should have sexual relations with his own wife. Don't have sex outside of marriage, and if you are sexually frustrated, you, you, you're hormonal, you just need to be married, get married. Go ahead. And each woman with her own husband. Yeah. The husband should fulfill his marital duty uh, to his wife and likewise the wife to her husband. Now stop. It didn't say privilege. It said what? Duty. Get hold of that. If you choose to get married, according to God, you each have a D-U-T-Y, a duty. Read on. <clears throat> The wife does not have authority over her own body. Stop. You hear what that said? I'm not in the mood. I don't want to have sex. The wife cannot say that. Read on. But the husband does. Ah! The husband <laughs> says, honey, I need... I'm going to warn my voice for people. <laughs> <laughs> Also, the husband does not have authority over his own body. So who's not in charge of who, how often we have sex? <coughs> Neither one are in charge. You're supposed to meet the need of each other. And if one is what some people would call super sex, which other people would call normal, 
and the other person is what they would call normal, and this person undersexed, then you have potential problem. Come on! We had relationships once this month, what more do you want? Some people would say. Every day! Read on. Stop depriving one another. Ah! It's absolutely prohibited to say no. Now, let me make some... If you marry somebody who is going to do a gossip, Agape is not self-centered, but you might not marry somebody who's going to do agape when it comes to sex. They're going to do eros. They're going to do me, myself, and I. And that includes you, us. I married you. You're my wife. It's legal. It's right. Do your duty. And some women have said, Oh, I feel like a whore, a prostitute. What am I supposed to do? I'm not in the mood. Do I just lay there and let him have his way with me? And the answer is there's something wrong up there in your head, lady. You're supposed to be biblical. And you're not if you're married, you're not supposed to be talking this, I feel like a prostitute, I feel like I'm being used. That's in your brain. The Bible says, don't get married. If you don't understand your duty, what preacher ever preaches this? I preached it one time as I preached through 1 Corinthians. And when I was through with it, I didn't come back to it. And I was very careful how I preached this passage. But we taped the ministry, and I felt like if people wanted to listen to it again, they could get the tape. And if they missed the message, I wasn't going to rehash my cabbage. Listen to the tape. I'm doing it one time in here. And I'm only doing it because this is what the Bible says. Go ahead. Except Pick up at the beginning of that sentence. Yeah. Stop depriving one another. Except by agreement for a time. Ah. I don't want to have sex. Well, I don't agree with that. <laughs> <laughs> that vetoed that. It has to be by agreement. Agreement. And it has to be time limited. So, and for specific reasons, name them. So, Just read on. We'll so that through. you may devote yourself to prayer. Prayer. And come together again so that. Sin. Command. Come together. That means have sex again. Go on. So that Satan will not tempt you because of your lack of self control. But this I say by... What, what is it? Lack of self-control. When you are depriving another in that marriage relationship, the devil is going to jump on that person and make him wish he was having sex and they agreed not to have sex for a day or two or three. And then he becomes more vulnerable because the devil always takes advantage of some types of people. Go ahead. But this I say by way of concession, not of command. All right. There. Oh! oh. You grab that verse and say, this is not a command. <laughs> this is concession. It's not the Word of God. And you have just denied 2 Timothy 3.16. What he means by concession rather than command, he did not have a quote from Jesus on this subject. I don't remember Jesus talking about marital relationships. Do you? He said, you're not to look on a woman to lust after in her heart. And he didn't say, you're not to look on a man to lust after him in his heart. So why didn't he give fair, equal time? Well, obviously, the people who are most motivated to look and lust are men rather than women. But... Both sects are supposed to stay pure in their mind. But he never did talk about marital relief. So the Holy Spirit is inspiring Paul to give this 
commands about what kind of relationship sexually is to take place in a marriage. Now, ladies and men, if you're not, if you don't want to obey this passage for Pete's sake and for the sake of your partner, don't get married. Don't get married. And if you have been taught that sex and, and intimacy and nakedness is wrong inside the bonds of a marriage. I have pity on your partner. You need to grow up and get biblical. There's a time and a place for all things, that is true. But within the bonds of marriage, you cease to be in charge of your own body. That's what we just read. Your partner is in charge. And when they want to have sex, they want to have sex. For you to say, I'm not in the mood, is unbiblical. Now, if there is a physical problem, your monthly cycle, if a person is going to be kind and considerate, and it's not going to be 1 Corinthians 7, 1 through 9, then there's, you're blessed, you're blessed. You, you have someone who is thoughtful and kind and considerate, not wanting for it to be other than happiness for you too. But not all people are wired that way. And you don't know for sure who you're getting unless you pay careful attention to how thoughtful and kind in other dimensions where a person strongly wishes that they could go on this date, or go here, or go there, or, or something they strongly want. And then when, when they don't get their way, they're all, oh man, they're all, they're all frustrated, emotionally upset. And, and well, that's a clue. But that's how this person, girl or guy, relates to emotional, to disappointment and frustration then that's exactly what they're going to do when they have frustration and disappointment in this area. They're going to, they're going to try to put you on a guilt trip. They're going to act like a spoiled brat. It's going to be all about them. And it's going to be obviously a real problem because it's certainly not going to make you feel better when somebody's beating on you verbally and trying to put you on a guilt trip because you're not willing wanting to have sex. And this is where this thing, so I don't want to. It's not because I can't. I'm just not in the mood. This is where people say, well, I just feel like, it makes me feel like a prostitute. Just, all right, go ahead and have your way. Well, did you hear what the passage says? That attitude is wrong. Questions or comments on 1 Corinthians 7, 1 through 9. So there's more than one way to go to hell. Just lying is not the only way you go to hell. Or having adultery. Sin is sin. Folks, if you want God's blessings on your life and on your marriage, and you need to hear what's being said here. And most parents aren't going to talk to you about their own sex life. They don't feel it's any of your business, not appropriate. And quite frankly, most kids don't like to know anything about their parents' sex life. They really don't. It grosses them out. That's their business. You know, I, don't, I, don't need, I don't need to. I don't want to know. <coughs> okay. Any questions? Yes? The next passage says, Yet I wish all men were even as myself am. Single, not married. Because you have less encumbrances, you can focus on Jesus, you can put Him first, you don't have to be thoughtful about your wife, you don't have to... More of your money can go to the work of the Lord than to, to her needs. That's why He says that. But not everybody has the gift of celibacy. That was a gift I never coveted. <laughs> Some people talk to growing up, I, I think I have to get this off. I just say, well, I'm happy for you. <laughs> I certainly don't. 
Yes. I, I read in some commentaries about that passage, and it said that it was because the church was under such persecution. That's that another that, reason. That Apostle Paul was giving that advice. It's harder to stay true to Jesus when they're torturing your wife and say we can. Well, quit torturing her. Don't you love your wife? Just recant. We'll let her free. And you have to watch your wife be horribly mutilated, raped, treated, grossly. You think that would be easy for a person? I don't. And so it's a serious thing to get married, especially in cultures where Christianity is bad stuff. Thanks, Joe. You're right. Any other comments? How many have had somebody in your adult years work through 1 Corinthians 7, 1 through 9 pointedly with you like I just did? One person. Okay. You're blessed. The rest of you just have been exposed to a passage of scripture that's very powerful and pointed and sometimes for some people difficult to live with. So again, be careful who you marry. It's no joke. It's no joke. Let's come to this. Can godly parents uh, rear godly children? <clears throat> I said yes. <clears throat> My wife said no. My wife didn't want to have children. Because she knew it was a crapshoot. And she said, look at the most godly people we know, Alan. Then he, she named the evangelist that we admired in the conservative holiness movement. She named all the godly people in church on Wednesday nights, little old ladies raising their hand, pray for their wayward kids. She said, what gives you or me, she already didn't have, so what gives you? I don't know what all words she used, but she was very strong in her belief. What gives you the belief that we can do a better job than all these very godly people whose kids are not serving God? Well, if I had agreed with the standard interpretation of Proverbs 22.6, I would have said, Proverbs 22.6, raise up a child in the way they should go, and when they're old, they won't depart from it. I would say that's Proverbs genre. That's not a promise. That's a general principle. And there are lots of exceptions to it. And I would have said, you're right. There's no way we can guarantee our children will serve God, so you don't want to spend the first 20 years of our married life, 25 years, sacrificing, giving, putting everything else on your career and what all on hold for children who they say will step on your toes when they're little, and then they grow up, they step on your heart. <laughs> so let's not have children. Unless you really think you're good at crap shooting, you can roll the winning combination. My wife was convinced she couldn't, so she said, I do not want to have children. Well, I wasn't prepared for that minority view. What would you say, guys, to a woman who sincerely believes that there's no way to determine whether or not your children are going to serve God? you can do your best and utterly fail, that they are all free moral agents. And if you go by statistics, there's almost no chance they're going to serve God. What would you do? Well, I was backed into a corner. I'd never met anybody who ever felt that way. Who in the world? She thought started believing, feeling this way at age nine? Nine? What little girl at nine is thinking those kind of thoughts? Well, she was, she's the daughter of Nazarene pastors, or 
dad and her mother both are ordained Nazarene ministers. Nadine's mother and father. And in the Nazarene church, pastoring Nazarene, Nazarene missionaries come. And the Nazarenes would bring, missionaries would bring their children, and children are told to go play while the adults are doing the dinner, getting them ready, and then children play with children. And at nine years old, she's listening to these missionary children tell about all their escapades. Sneaking out of the house, out of the windows at night with their parents not knowing, doing all kinds of things that their parents didn't know. And Nadine was not intrigued and uh, excited with all of the larceny and uh, all of the violation of parental rules. She was horrified. And she started thinking, if these are their missionary children, then what would my children someday be doing too? I saw lots of preachers' kids who didn't do right. I never personalized it, and I never was bummed out by it. I mean, here's somebody who's doing areas of thinking that's foreign to me. And so I said, well, I'm going to take Proverbs 22, 6 as a promise. You can't do that. Well, I did. And she said, you know... I said, I, I, I said, I'll, uh, I'll make seem sure that my children serve God. She said, it's impossible. You can't. I said, I will. I said, if I could get the devil scared out of me as an intelligent person and be freaked out and scared of going to hell because of my sin and believe in the hell, and be motivated to know I don't want to go there, then can't. Other people with normal intelligence figure out that screaming and burning all eternity is not a cool way and a place to do. And if you don't live right, that's where you're going. And you can drop dead at any moment, get in an accident, be killed and go to hell. I was scared to death to go to hell. And I kept me seeking God and wanting to do right for no other reason than a fire escape. I knew I didn't want to burn. For sure. Didn't take a lot of brains to know that. <laughs> people say, I don't think you ought to scare people in the salvation. Well, I do, thank God. Noah built an ark. You know why Noah built an ark? Moved by fear, not because, oh, this is cool. I love you so much, God. I will build this ark out of love toward you. No, sir. Scripture says, Noah moved by fear built an ark. And I moved by fear went to the altar regularly. <laughs> Anybody else know what it is to be scared down to the altar and get right with God? Anybody in here? Moved by fear? Well, that's smart, in my opinion. So I said, I think our ch I can influence my children. I'll have to do stuff, whatever. Nobody else does, evidently. But I want. I will convince them, influence their their impressionable minds that the greatest thing in the whole world is to be a Christian and the dumbest, stupidest thing, there are bad words, but that's exactly what it is, is to be a sinner. And so I will have to do everything under heaven and earth that nobody else does. Nobody knows, nobody's going to be around to tell me how to do this. How am I going to make sinners look dumb and Christians look great for my kids to want to be Christians? Because we typically want to be like people we admire. Is that true? So, I promised my wife I'll see to it they serve God. She looked me in the face and pointed a finger at me to the best of my memory and said, and I will hold you accountable. And I think she said, but I can't prove this, and I'll never forgive you if they don't. She didn't mean that. But she said it because that expressed how strongly. So, guess what happened to me? I suddenly had to stop being a natural, normal American man who's a Christian. And I had to become weird, strange, different in my approach to marriage and children. Because nobody I knew was saying what she was saying. And nobody I knew was saying, Proverbs 22.6 is a promise, and if I, my kids don't serve God, then it's because we failed to train them up in the way they should go. 
you say that, and you've just crushed and hurt the majority of parents because they have at least one child or more that's not serving God. So, obviously I was adopting the minority view. But you know what happened? Because my wife was that way, I could not become a typical preacher in America. I could not be ministry oriented, ministry oriented, ministry oriented. I had to be family oriented, family oriented. My ministry hurts my family. I give up that ministry. Family oriented. Family oriented. What did that mean? That meant I had to figure out what to do, and I had no manual and nobody to help me. But I started looking. Are there any families where all the kids are serving God? I found a few, and I would go and talk to the minister. I said, you know, I really admire your family, and, and here I'm, I'm, a, I'm a young father, and I, I what have you done? What, what, do you, what do you feel like has caused your children to want to serve God? I picked their brains. I wrote it down. I made lists. And then I started adopting that stuff. And wife and I prayed, and we strategized. And we prayed and we strategized. And so I began saying, what's the greatest thing in the whole world? And my children, when they're, all they can do is smile at you. When you smile at them, they can't talk. I started doing it. The greatest thing in the whole world, the love is from Jesus. And I'd clap my hand. I'd stand them on my lap and clap their hand. Love is from Jesus. Yay. Where did Jesus live? In your heart. I've said that thousands and thousands and thousands of times. And then I said, you know, I hear music is supposed to be very, very powerful. I want, honey, what music do you, we, our children need to go sleep to godly music. So she liked Bob Daniels, I liked Bob Daniels. Not all of Bob Daniels, but I liked his, his couple records of singing lovely hymns in a quiet, without a big band, back in that one, in a quiet way. And I made recordings of that on cassette player, and my kid would go in the bassinet, and we'd boop, Night lights on, and the player's on low. My wife goes out after burping the baby and putting it in there. Bob Daniels singing, there's room at the cross for you, and all these wonderful hymns. And all night long until that tape comes to the end, it turns off automatically. Our children are exposed to those kind of songs. Why am I doing that? I don't know how to train kids to serve God. There's no guarantee. And I guaranteed. Therefore, I better do everything possible if it is to surround my kids with godly. How do I create spiritual appetites in my kids? So I'm praying, oh God, give my kids spiritual appetites. Lord, help us to avoid bringing into this home or doing whatever will trigger the sins of the fathers that will cause. So. Christmas time here, her mother-in-law, my mother-in-law, her mom gives a Fisher Price. We're poor. We didn't have our, our kids grew up playing with as they were, they were little with the, the, the lids on on the Tupperware uh, bowls. The, the, the kids they pulled them out, they pulled out the pans, they play with the pans and the lids. They were happy. Well, we felt bad that we couldn't have nifty toys. <clears throat> It's parental stuff up here that wants all this nifty stuff. The kids aren't saying, I need Fisher Price toys when they can't even talk. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And so they're happy doing that. And I, I'm listening. They're just starting to speak. And I, I hear this little high squeaky boy. The millions come, there's still room for one. I'm thinking, dude, the music they've heard hundreds and hundreds and times. 365 nights uh, a year for years is getting in their head and they're not singing, hey, pa, pa, da, da. that's all this worldly stuff. They're singing godly hymns. 
They're not singing Disney songs and, and all this kind of stuff that typical parents get for their kids. I'm not criticizing anything parents do. Don't hear me wrongly. I'm saying I am desperately serious about how to create desires in Philip and Nathan that are godly. So I'm, I'm doing my best to tell them, Daddy loves you. And, and then, uh, so Christmas present, we get a Fisher Price toy. And what is it? It has a knob here, a knob here, and it has a deal that circles around, and it looks just like a television set. We open it up. And look at him. I'm thinking bad words that I, sh I don't want to use about what kind of intelligence is my mother in law. They don't have a TV. We don't have a TV. What are we doing putting a Fisher Price? My wife said, I'm sure it never entered my mom's mind. It was just a toy that revolved around. She never even recognized it to be a plastic television set. So we never made a big deal about it. I looked at her, and she looked at me, and we communicated that this is weird, but we never made a big deal, and a week or a half or so it disappeared, and the boys never knew it disappeared. It just disappeared. We never made a big deal. It just disappeared, and there was, they kept playing with other stuff. So we didn't want to alienate, hurt our in-laws. I didn't. You know, I just, what are they doing? Hey, people do best they know how without thinking. They do lots of stuff that you might not approve of and then you've got to be careful how you handle it. Is that right? Exactly right. So I, I, uh, we, we, I made a deal with my boys when they begin to read. I was praying, Lord, give them a tender heart. I would ask them, you know, children must have free dialogue with their parents, so I would tell them, I love you, and how are we doing? And uh, dad, has daddy hurt your feelings? And if I have, forgive me, let's talk about it. I, when we had our house rules, uh, my wife once in a while would convene family and she'd say, I want to apologize to you boys that I haven't been as consistent in enforcing the rules as I should. Would you boys please forgive me and pray for your mama that she will be consistent when you don't do what you do, that she'll paddle you like you need to be paddled. Would you would you help me pray for Mama? That they, they never said no. They always said yes. And they heard Mama humbling herself. And they would hear me if, if my wife thought that something I'd said was not properly balanced, nuanced, or whatever. She talked to me privately in the bedroom. serving God. My goal is not to hurt, to damage, to wound in any way. And I want to be reasonable. And so I would make adjustments. And I'd come out for a little while. I'd call the boys. You know, boys, I've been thinking and praying. And I just feel like I need to modify what I said. And here's what I want. You know, and if I hurt you, forgive me. Why did I do that? Not because I have fun in saying, I'm sorry, forgive me. I don't like that any more than you like it. I was desperately serious about my kids finding God and serving God. And they had to have a dad who was tender and sensitive and had a reverse gear. And so I told the boys, anytime you think something's unreasonable, come, we'll talk about it. We're always going to be reasonable. If it doesn't make sense, talk to us. Can't read your mind, talk to us, we'll explain. And there came a time when they said, I don't think we need, should have to go to bed at 9 anymore. Well, 9, that's an arbitrary number. 7, 8, 9, whatever you want your kids to do, that's what you choose to do, right? And here they're saying, don't think it, we should be allowed to stay up. I said, fine. We're a family gathering. As Canadians, is that all right with you? As long as you boys can get up in the morning with a good attitude and make your bed and clean your room before you go to school. As long as everything functions well, what, what do you think is reasonable? When do you want to go to bed? Ten. Okay, fine. Fine, I don't care. It's, but if you're tired and grumpy, then we'll put it back to nine. 
Let's try it. Well, they were happy. You don't have rules. But why? Because I said so. Oh, man, there's that many purpose, I would never do that to my kids. I said so. You basically mean, because I'm bigger than you. And I look forward to the day when I was angry, when I was going to beat my dad to the ground. I look forward to that day. And he created that in me. By his unwise. Children are to be seen and not heard. I hated that one too. If I said something about my mom's cooking, Mom, why do we have to have this again? He said, if you don't like what's on the table, eat what you brought with you, son. Well, what did I bring with me? Nothing. That was a lousy. That made me mad, too. <laughs> as long as you put your feet under my table. I said that one time. My wife came unglued privately. <laughs> she said, what in the world as long as you put your feet under my table? Are you teaching them that these courtesy and these things are only for our home and that you're teaching them to want to get out of here? I said, I'm sorry. <laughs> That's what I heard in my life growing up. As long as you put your feet under my table, as long as you're in this home. She said, we're not teaching them our rules. We're teaching them how to be godly, considerate, Christian men. Little guys. I said, yes, ma'am. That's right. I said, I didn't know any better. I'm sorry. Now I was like, please don't hurt me. But I didn't know how to do that then. But uh, so I never said it again. Oh, no. Tempted to, but I remembered. Her blazing, flashing eyes. My wife knows how to articulate her feelings and her opinions. I needed a woman like that. Hey, you don't like something? Tell me. I have brains. I can hear. I can't guess and read your mind. I can deal with confrontation. I can't deal with a non-communicative person who just cries. <laughs> that would have, that would have, that would have, I would have, I'm, I'm sure I would have grown in grace. I would have had to. <laughs> and I would have tried my best, but probably it would have taken quite a long while for me to become, become a very tender, sensitive, compassionate, long-suffering, endurance person as my wife is unhappy and I have no clue. And I'll have to wait a week or two until she finally figures out how to say it. I couldn't take that. <laughs> God, sometimes I wished in the past that I had something like that. <laughs> but that didn't last long. It didn't last long. Are there any questions so far? What, what about, so what, what, what are the techniques? My, my, Philip was 16 or 17. He comes into Nadine and says, Mom, you and Dad have done a really good job on us boys. We love God. We haven't gone through a teenage rebellion. I want to raise my children just like you raised us. How did you do it? Would you please write it down so I'll know how to do it too? So she wrote a book. Tyndall House published it. And it's, their title was How to Have Character, Children with Character, Even if You Have Character for Characters for my wife's desired title was Character by the Inch. We had the door jam behind our bedroom door. The boys would come in. On their birthday, we'd put on some work for how high they are. And we would put the age on that door jam. It was behind the door. And nobody would see it. it. Must have been the door was shut. And people don't typically be in our bedroom with the door shut. <laughs> So we left it there. That was our history. And uh, she envisioned teaching children character by the inch. She was, and how to do it, and how to have mottos, and how to have pictures, and 
not try to work on everything all at once. And you ought to get her book and read it if you're interested. And uh, then I wrote down for my boys what I practiced, and I have you read that. And uh, you haven't read it yet. Rearing Godly Children, a Guide for Fathers. I thought, well, I haven't tried to put this in a pamphlet or a brochure or publish it. But I thought, uh, if nobody has helped you to know what to do as a dad, these are the things I found helpful. I read, I inquired, and I practiced these. So, what you, uh, I, 44 basic principles to follow. Probably the biggest one is don't provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the fear and the admonition and the nurture of the Lord. And it's that passage that made me see it was not my re wife's responsibility to train the children. Mother's Day, you hear about, you hear all the syrupy, sweet stuff about mothers. Don't you? Poem, testimonies about how much mama meant to me. I don't know what I'd be today if it weren't for mama's prayers and mama's love and mama's this and mama's that. Then Father's Day come along. What happened to all the syrupy sweet poems? What happened to all the heroes? The message is how to be a better father. You never hear a message on how to be a better mother. I mean, talk about female shamanism. Mother's Day, we laud the mothers. Father's Day, beat on fathers. Tell them to do a better job. I was guilty of that until I finally revolted. We're going to laud and be surfy sweet about mothers, then let's laud and be surfy sweet about fathers and talk about how wonderful fathers are. Aren't there good fathers? Amen. Shouldn't they have equal time? 